All right, I just wanted to go over a few topics with you. Um, this one we talked about briefly just after you handed in the quiz, and I think you got it, but just in case uh, there is any uh, not clarity, uh, I wanted to just go over it. So um, all we need to do is establish a relationship between um, r and theta. We need a, a, an equation that goes r equals blah, 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 theta somewhere in there, yada, yada. Right, theta, you can plug something in for theta, calculate something based on that, and that gives you an r. All right. So without getting in the, uh, going into the explanation, I, I think I go into that uh, in uh, the other video about polar functions. Uh, x is equal to r cosine. Okay, remember, x and cosine are both horizontal. Right? Y equals r sine theta. Y and, the, or y and sine are both vertical. Okay, so if I just replace this x and this y, and then solve for r, I'm good to go. Okay, so this relationship between x and r and theta, and between y and r and theta as well. And so if we replace this, this would be r cosine theta minus r sine theta plus 8 equals 0. We now have a parametric function, right? There's a relationship between theta and r, and it exactly mirrors the relationship between x and y here. It would create the same graph, uh, is what I'm saying. So um, now we'll just solve for r, right? So this term and this term both have r's in them, so we'll factor out that r. We'll get 9 cosine theta minus sine theta plus 8 equals 0. We'll solve for r, and r is going to be equal to negative 8 divided by 9 cosine theta minus sine theta. Okay. And there we go. I mean, that's good enough. That is a, a function of theta. It gives r, and it will create the same graph as this because we know that x and y were replaced with equivalent uh, expressions. And we'll go to the next page. Uh, okay, so this question about what's the area of one petal of this thing? Um, you guys followed the formula really well, you know, from a to b of 1 half r squared theta, which turns into from a to b, uh, we'll put the 1 half out here, you guys did, of uh, r of theta, whatever that function looked like, squared times d theta, right? r of theta is our r, we square it, d theta is our theta, so there we go. Um, now, how do we pick these limits? Uh, I think you guys both had the same idea. Um, you know, if we take our function, and and Kendra, you have these uh, you have these limits correct, and Connor, you had the right idea. Um, I didn't write this down right. So let's just talk about it really quickly. In general, one petal of this thing is going to happen. So this this graph looks something like. Well, let me draw it out slowly. Okay. So it's going to look something like this. When theta is 0, the sine of theta is also 0, right? Now it's going to go like this, one petal, something like this, and come back down. When did that happen? Well, it went between uh, theta is 0, right? See, this is 0. This is another angle, angle, pi over 4, pi over 3. We're getting closer and closer and closer to pi over 2 is when it finally comes back down to 0. When you can imagine like an R, a radius shooting out, shooting out, shooting out, shooting out, shooting out, and what angles these are happening, at which angles these are happening, then you can kind of see what your limits of integration are going to be, right? If you just graph it and you just imagine those R's being shot out there, you can naturally see from 0 to pi over 2, right? When is this pedal going to happen? It's going to happen from between a 0 and the next 0, right? That's when it's going to happen. So that's the other thing we want to think about. And then this, this thing will happen again there, right? So imagine these R's being shot out like this, shot out like this. And then it's going to continue like this. So it's gone through do pi over 2. It's gone from pi over 2 to pi, right, with negative R's, OK? And now we're coming around. We're actually in this quadrant now shooting out R's uh, in the positive direction between um, where are we? Pi and 3 pi over 2. And then we come around between 3 pi over 2 with negative r's. And we're going to come back around to 2 pi. And there's 
our full sig. Then we want to find the area of this guy right here, and we can see it that it happens between 0 and pi over 2, or we can say when will this function, which gives me r, give me an r of 0, and find all the places where that happens. So I just solve for theta. Okay, sine of 2 theta equals 0 when I divide by 6. Uh, 2 theta equals the inverse sine of 0. So 2 theta equals, well, when, when is the sine 0 at uh, 0, at pi, at 2 pi, at 3 pi, 4 pi, 5 pi, 6 pi, any multiple of pi, right? Then we divide by 2, pi is equal to n pi, n pi over 2. Let me rewrite that. n pi over 2. So the, I mean, between, uh, where n is, uh, is an integer, between any two values of n, the easiest ones would be for theta is... 0 pi over 2, or 0, and 1 pi over 2, or pi over 2. So I'm not sure you come up with that, but that's, um, you know, I imagine what they showed you in the video and what I would recommend doing. Okay, so we found the limits. They're going to be between 0 and pi over 2. Of what? Uh, well, we, like I said, we use the formula quite nicely. Uh, we have 6 sine of 2 theta squared d theta. Um, this next part, this is something that um, that I believe both of you missed. Um, Connor, you didn't even take the antiderivative of that, and I think you know that you didn't. Um, so what should we do now? Well, this is being squared. What's being squared? This whole thing is being squared. That would give us a 36 sine squared of 2 theta d theta, right? 36, not 6. So that'll come out here. We got 18, 0 to pi over 2, um, of sine squared 2 theta d theta. So we've got the, these were on your cheat sheets. Uh, what do we do about a sine squared? It's a very difficult thing to take the antiderivative of. If we had something, just for instance, really quickly, like the antiderivative of sine squared theta cosine theta d theta, well then we have something like u squared du, right? But we don't have that. We just have sine squared. So what do we do with a problem like a sine squared? Um, well, we use one of the identities, one of the uh, um, identity, uh, trig identities. Well, what's it called? The, I think it's called the double angle formula or the power reducing formula, something like that. But the si in general, the uh, sine squared of, uh, let's say an angle, I'll use x instead of theta to avoid confusion, is 1 half times 1 minus cosine of twice that angle. Okay, So in this case, it would be 1 half times 1 minus um, uh, so the cosine of twice this angle, which would be 4 times theta, d theta. I just wanted to double check that before we got too far. So yes, 1 half times 1 minus cosine 4 theta, d theta. All right, that's 18, 0 to pi over 2 of, well, we want to take the 1 half out there, right? Well, so put that over 2. That's 9, of course. And then uh, we want to look at this integrand right here. And this is where Kinder got a little turned around. Okay, what we need to do really is um, treat these as two separate integrals. Okay, because this guy here needs a little u substitution done on it. Okay, so that's what we need to recognize. Let's kind of stretch this out. Keep going. So we get 9 times the first integral of 1 d theta minus the second integral of cosine 4 theta d theta. Um, 
So what do we do about this? So this is really close. Like the, the antiderivative of this is almost sine of 4 theta. You could almost just go sine of 4 theta. But here's the problem. If you take the derivative of sine of 4 theta, you're going to get cosine of 4 theta times 4, right? Cosine of theta times 4 d theta. So we need to put a 1 fourth out there. And that's all we needed to do. So this would be 1 fourth times this from 0 to pi over 2. Right? And of course, this would be theta from 0 to pi over 2. We'd be subtracting. We've got a multiple of 9 out here. All right, so this one is going to be um, pi over 2 minus 0. Uh, this guy is going to come out to be 0 because we got 1 fourth times the sine of 4 theta, sine of 4 times pi over 2. So what is 4 times 4 times? What am I writing? Pi over 2. Well, 4 times pi over 2 is 2 pi. The sine of that is 0. Uh, minus, right, the sine of, well, 4 times 0. That's just 0. The sine of 0 is 0. So we wind up with a 9 times just pi over 2. 9 pi over 2. That looks like a nothing. OK, that's a 2. Let's pretend that's a 2. All right, last thing here, parametric. Uh, finding the second derivative. Um, you're all doing well with uh, dy dx equals dy dt over dx dt. OK, but what about the second derivative? What about d second derivative? You know, like that. What is that? Um, I'm going to pause for just a second and collect my thoughts. OK, so we want to find the second derivative of y with respect to x. OK, uh, well, we have uh, this thing. Uh, so we, we know that. The, the thing is, you can't just take the derivative, like this derivative over this derivative again. OK, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't work that way. Um, so how are we going to find the second derivative, the derivative of y with respect to x, you know, the second time? Um, well, it doesn't, it's not as straightforward as it might seem. Let's start with dy, well, let's start with d dt of d dy dx. Okay, we're going to take the derivative of something with respect to t, um, a function of, of x with respect to t. Imagine that we're going to take the derivative of uh, 2x squared plus 5. With respect to t, d dt of 2x squared plus 5, well, we're going to get uh, 4x you know, plus 0, right? That's the derivative of, of this guy with respect to x. And then what do we need to do? We need to use the chain rule, multiply by uh, dx dt, essentially. Right? What is the derivative of the variable x with respect to t? Okay. So if we look at this guy, we're going to take the derivative of this. Let's just say we take the derivative of this, like we took the derivative of this, right? It was just 4x. It's just whatever the derivative of that is normally with respect to x, right? So that would be, like if we had a, a, a dy dx, a normal looking dy dx, because um, keep in mind, this thing is in terms of t. It's got t's throughout. It doesn't have x's, right? So what is, what's the derivative of this with respect to x? Uh, or, or what, yeah, what's the derivative of this with respect to x? Well, it's just this. It's the, the second derivative, right? If I were to take the derivative of a function that is a function of x, I would just take the, the, the derivative of that function. I'm just taking the second derivative. But here's the thing. This is a function of x, just like this was, as an example. We're going to need to multiply by dx dt, by the chain rule. OK? So that's all it takes. So well, here's the, here's the cool thing. Um, we can now solve for this guy. We can divide by dx dt. So we have d dt of dy dx over dx dt. All right. Now, how do we take the derivative of this guy here, dt of dy dx, d dt of dy dx? Uh, well, to take the derivative of this, of dy dx, uh, we are going to take the derivative of d 
dy dt over dx dt. How are we going to take the derivative of this thing? With the quotient rule. We're going to take the derivative of this. With respect to t, we're going to use the quotient rule. Okay. I mean, that may sound a little confusing because up here to get dy dx, we just take dy dt over dx dt. And um, and now we're using the, the quotient rule. I, don't, I mean, I, I could see some room for confusion. Um, but we first wanted to find dy dx, okay? So we come up with this convenient thing where the dt's cancel and we get dy dx. But to take the derivative, the second derivative, it's not as simple, right? We need to um, realize that this guy is in terms of t. So um, to find dy dx, we've, we've got to incorporate the derivative with respect to t. Um, but if you go back and you watch this explanation here, if that makes sense, then dividing by dx dt on both sides is no big deal. Okay, so now that we have this, we take the derivative of this using the quotient rule. It's over dx dt, um, and I'm sure that you can take the derivative of this with respect to, uh, with respect to t, the quotient rule, no problem. So when we have, um, looking at one of your tests here, um, x equals t plus 4, y equals t squared plus 8t, uh, we get dy dt is 2t plus 8 over dx dt, which is 1, okay? And when we go to, you know, this is dy dx, when we go to take the derivative of this, we can't just take the derivative of this or so the derivative of that. Say that that's zero and it's undefined. Can't do that. Um, and really, technically, we need to uh, follow this guy here. Okay. So, but the the convenient thing is that this is over one, right? So why write that? It's just two t plus eight. So when we go to take this with respect to um, Let's see. Yeah, when we when we go to take the derivative of, of this with respect to t, it's as easy as, as doing this. Like we don't even really need the quotient rule in this case because it's over one. Uh, so when we take the derivative of this with respect to t, we just get two. Okay, over dx dt is again one. Okay, so the derivative, the second derivative is two. Okay. So if we were to find the uh, slope at, in this question, is at 3, then of course we would get 6 plus 8, that's 14. The, uh, the second derivative is always worth 2, so the second derivative is always positive, which means that the slope is 14. And the concavity is, uh, is up. Okay. So... Um, I hope that made things clearer and not muddier. If uh, you have any questions, confusions, uh, or kudos and accolades and applause, uh, then just let me know. Um, thanks for watching.